Dylan, and I'm the editor and founder of It's Freezing LA, which is an independent magazine about climate change. And we're based in London. We've been around for just over a year. So the images on the screen are of our second issue, which came out in January. Um, and we've got our third issue coming out in June. So keep an eye out for that if you like what we're doing. So it was interesting being asked to do this talk about mobilizing flows, because that was really why we started, especially flows that are vortex-shaped or um, more circular. Because in engineering, which is my background in science, the frameworks people put climate change in are, as I'm sure you've discussed a lot today, really linear. They're all, not necessarily linear, but really one directional. So people talk about the fact that we want the system to be a stable temperature, and yet we keep doing things which heat it up. We talk about taking materials from the ground at a faster rate than you can replenish them. And those are very powerful because it's really clear what we're doing wrong. But at the same time, they're often not hugely inspiring. What we've found as a team, and also I think most people we've talked to who are engaged with climate have found, is that people who are really passionate about change tend to have slightly more imaginative reasons. Again, as you're saying about vortexes, ideas that catch their attention that aren't necessarily completely about facts and, and figures. And so we chose independent magazines because they're a really great way to catch both ends. You've got this edited, fact-checked, really curated object, which means you can make sure the science is communicated very precisely, which is obviously really, really important. People also expect it to be really beautiful, and they expect it to have lots of different ideas and languages and different contributors in. And so that blend of art and science is something that my editorial team and our artistic team have tried really hard to make work. So I'm just going to talk, I'm going to run through some pictures of our second issue and just pick out some of the different ideas we've tried to incorporate um, to try and make this a problem people are more interested by. Um, and I'm also going to talk about some of the articles we've featured because hopefully they might be interesting in terms of different ideas around circularity. So, well, as you can see from our contents page, the sort of key feature of the magazine is that all our articles are completely different. So every single one comes from a different field. And we think this is really effective because it means that even if someone's normally really interested by fashion or design and they might pick the magazine up, they've also got an article next door which is about something they might never have picked up a book about. So it's a great way to make sure you're communicating ideas across disciplines, which of course is completely essential to any kind of circular approach to something. So to give some examples, um, one of the first, probably our biggest articles in our second issue was by Caroline Lucas. So we asked her to make a case for profound change. And she wrote us this really nice article. I was going to read something from it, but I forgot it, so you'll just have to buy a copy. Um, and it was really political. It's always someone, something people's heard of. It's something that we can learn from. So most of our contributors are slightly earlier in their careers. So the idea was to invite her as a guest to talk to us. Um, and here we have one of our illustrations, which hasn't come out too well on the screen, but it's by Nina, who's here with me today, who's our art director and illustrator. But then in contrast to Caroline's article, just sort of 20 pages on, we have this article, who's, which is by Hayley Hardstaff, who's a biologist, and it's about toxic algae in Florida. And she describes this problem, which is these, these red algae which are taking over and causing incredible destruction to the ecosystem. And she says that people are very convinced that scientists are solving it. And they are. They're doing extraordinary work. But it's not their problem completely. They rely on public opinion. They rely on popular engagement to get the funding, to get the community, to get the political support to do their work. And the illustrations here are by uh, Mary Herbert. And the two together we really like as a combination. We think that if they're done, if they're written really excessively and about engaging topics, those are ideas that anyone engaged with the environment should have some basic vocabulary to talk about. Maybe not should, but, but might want to. And then on, not to separate them too much, but on the design side, our design is done by Matthew Lewis. Um, and it's really what knits together this kind of mosaic of ideas through the magazine. Um, so you'll see on all the pages, we've got this very um, vibrant graphical um, imagery. And Matthew uses what he calls visual truth. So he finds data and images about the environment and uses them to build these graphics. So in our first issue, we used um, 
average surface temperature maps of the globe um, for years since the Industrial Revolution. So as you turn the pages, they get more red, showing we're heating. And this, these ones here were about um, were taken from videos of the California wildfires. So the idea was that climate change enhances the conditions that cause these fires, but also the fires escalate that by causing massive ecological destruction. And then just a note on the article here, just by Grace Richardson Banks, is about um, a history article, and it's about um, a history of people trying to change the weather. And she links that to modern geoengineering and talks about the fact that people take it very personally and that people think they can change the weather. So another element of design that we use is this sort of tessellating pattern, um, which is which is useful because it is quite an economic and a quite ecological use of paper. So we managed to fit quite a lot into what is um, quite a small magazine with sort of B5. Um, and then we also, it also lets us use these quite neat little glossaries and, and footnotes to, to try and pull out some terminology people might not be familiar with. And I'm going to come back to this article at the end. Um, and then sort of the final part of our kind of approach is these really beautiful illustrations. So this one's by Charlotte Ager. Um, and it's for an article about um, theatre and stage lighting and how there was nearly a really huge problem with that clashing against energy efficiency regulations that didn't take into account sort of market lag and complexity of some of these, these different things. Um, and the illustrations are important because they're done hand in hand with the text, so we work very closely between the illustrator and the um, text teams. Um, but also, they're all hand-rendered, which is a style that Nina and Matthew have um, very deliberately chosen. Because generally, in, in environmental communication, we see these really slick graphics and sort of scientific infographic images, uh, which are absolutely great. But it's really strange that you don't see you know, art and things that historically people have used to communicate emotions and ideas. Um, so we really like the idea of, of trying to bring that really to the forefront of what we're doing. And so, just to finish, I'm not going to talk too much about sort of our production, because um, I'm assuming people kind of know, but I'm really happy to um, later if people are interested. But one thing I did want to talk about production is about the important importance of diversity of voices in what we do. Um, and this article is by Suzanne Dalliwell about um, putting indigenous communities at the forefront of any kind of discussion about environmental protection. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in your program that you've got um, look, you had lots of discussions about this today, um, and I think especially interesting in the context of the circular economy, which is often criticised for making things about production and putting that out of people's responsibility. It makes it very hidden from, public, from the public. And I think something we've really enjoyed doing and have really learned from is the fact that if you are building, if you're communicating the environment, you have to go out and invite those voices to join your discourse. You have to choose what you're consuming and what you're inviting other people to consume if you're going to build these, these conversations. And particularly when, you, when it comes to circularity, circularity, whether it's building a product, cradle to grave or cradle to cradle, um, every, everyone along the way needs to have thought about what they're doing and who they're listening to. And so that's something we see as a really big priority and, and as I said, it's been a really interesting way of getting, getting new voices. Um, so I might leave it there and pass over to you, but as I say, um, thank you all for listening and if you're interested in writing or drawing for us, please get in touch with always looking for people.